the free users of that authority. Hence the importance of the referendum, because if you look at what's happened since 1972, Europe has taken powers which it thinks it keeps forever, has no intention of really giving up Lisbon may contain an exit clause, but certainly the euro was meant to be permanent. We'll see whether it is or not. And that if the British people are supposed to give up power on a permanent basis, they must be consulted about it. And then the question is whether the referendum lock is genuinely a lock or not, or whether, in fact, it's mere political posturing that the government would come in and would say, um, we're not going to do that, we're just going to legislate to sign up to a constitution or whatever comes next from, from Europe. Um, I think it's very difficult to be certain, but the one thing you can be sure of, that a government that decided to cede major further powers to Europe would use up a huge amount of political capital doing so without a referendum. And our constitution works on the basis of political reality, not necessarily of legal definitions. And I hope I didn't upset the lawyers in too much by saying that. But when you look at the whole issue of statute law, which we've been discussing carefully in the European Scrutiny Committee, where does it come from? Why suddenly was it decided that an Act of Parliament approved by the Crown, the Queen in Parliament, was the highest form of law and could overturn any other form of law? But it doesn't come out of anything. It comes out of the political reality that led to kings in the past deciding that that's what they had to do to bind the political nation in. If you were to ask Henry VIII, why did he legislate to disestablish the monasteries? Why did he not do it by simple act of him as king? It wasn't because the judges would have refused to accept what he said. The judges were quite cowed by Henry VIII and were appointed on, uh, at his majesty's pleasure, so they weren't able to oppose the king. He did it because it was the political reality. He needed the support of the political nation. And I think that remains true now, that statute law will work as long as it has the backing of the electorate and cannot still be challenged by the judges. But European law has come in above that and needs to be uh, reminded that it's only there by, by Act of Parliament. Hence, uh, moving on to, to Clause 18, uh, and what Clause 18 is really doing. And the government is very clear on its intention about Clause 18, which is the, the sovereignty clause, um, and that is that it's not changing anything at all. Now, those of us of a more Eurosceptic point of view who would like to make it clear that European Union law is actually subsidiary to British law and that there can't be a higher law in Britain than British law. The government never wanted to do that and hasn't said that it's doing that. What it's simply doing is saying that the 1972 Act is an ordinary Act of Parliament which can be amended and could be repealed, and that therefore European law only has effect in this country because Parliament says so. And is that an important reminder of the real situation, or is it actually rather dangerous to indicate that um, our whole system of government uh, is dependent on an initial system of law that is not established anywhere else. And it depends who you listen to. I and mean, Bill Cash is very concerned about Clause 18. He thinks there is the risk that it allows the judges to have more influence over statute law, that it brings them in to say, because the authority of Parliament is established by law, that is now justiciable, and we can say whether a law is a valid law or not. And he thinks that this is potentially a risk there unless it's amended. The alternative view is to say, in 1972 and 1973, nobody would have had any doubt that European law was coming in by an act of parliament. But because we've moved on 40 years, people think that perhaps it's there with its own standing, that it's developed as our constitution develops into something that is no longer linked to the bill that brought it in, the act that brought it in. And that this just returns the status quo to where everybody would have accepted it would have been in 1972. Um, I think it would be very interesting to see how the debates go and what amendments we get to the sovereignty clause 
to see if the government is willing to accept things like bringing it into the 1972 uh, European Communities Act by amendment that will give it greater strength and security. I, I think we do have to be nervous of more judge-made law, which is one of the things that has been happening to our constitution in recent years. That one of the virtues of not having a written constitution is that the final artist of the law is always Parliament rather than the judges. If you look at the United States Constitution, of course, the judges have the final say on controversial issues. We don't have that. We've got a system where ultimately Parliament can decide. Um, but judges have been getting more involved. And I think those of us who like the Constitution as it is are reluctant to see more judicial activism and would be very reluctant to support this bill if it ended up leading to the judges having more power. Having said that, to come back to the bit on referendums, that does allow a minister's decision to be challenged in the courts. And this is a bind that I think those of us who want the referendum lot find ourselves in. Somebody has to decide whether the referendum is needed on marginal issues. And I absolutely agree with Martin that if you had it on every issue, you would have it on something very trivial at some point, which would bring the whole idea of referendums into disrepute. Who is to make that decision? Well, on the European Scrutiny Committee, I might think that the European Scrutiny Committee would be the ideal arbiter of this. Except, of course, they could fire me and put in uh, a whole load of um, pro-European liberals, and then they'd agree to anything. So that wouldn't necessarily work. So who else do you have other than, other than the minister? But if you have a minister, there has to be some challenge to the minister, which is bringing the courts in, which is, of course, one of the things we're trying to avoid. So it's accepting, I think, as I was saying to Sheila beforehand, that half a loaf is better than no bread that this moves some way to protecting our constitutional arrangements, to clarifying the situation as everybody would have understood it to be in 1973, that is by virtue of Parliament we're in the European Union, but then to give this added protection that nothing more can be given away without the say-so of the British people, whose power it is in the first place. And I think it's extremely timely. Because if you look at what's happening at the moment with the euro potentially at the point of collapse, with countries having their economies <coughs> ruined by their membership of the euro, there are certainly those who are saying the answer is more Europe. And we have to be very worried that if that happens, we get drawn into more Europe, even though we don't want it. I think with the referendum lock, even if the act hasn't fully come into force, this government would find it impossible to sign up to more Europe within the next year or two. But they, even if the act isn't formally in, even if the referendum lock isn't formally in place, this government would be bound to behave as if it were in place. And that means that if we get the lock in reasonably quickly, and the push from Europe as the euro collapses is for more Europe, we can successfully resist it. Which basically comes back to my final point, or my first point, that we are dealing with the political reality as much as with the legal system. And the political reality of that is this is the British people are fed up with Europe, they don't like it, they don't want it in the world. Thank you very much indeed, Jacob. Now we're going to open the discussion to the floor. Um, the, this part of the discussion is under Chatham House rules, and I stress that because last week we had a speaker from the European Central Bank, who uh, apparently, um, he was not apparent about being open to being reported by Reuters, but Reuters reported him out of context, and that led to problems with, in the ECB, where there was reluctance about one of the issues raised, which is more Europe, or a European um, Eurobond, which uh, the ECB was very much against at that time, but it was not a public discussion. So that is, it's quite interesting that, so we're going to have this as a private discussion and then the last part uh, will be formal again and that can be reported without consulting our speakers. Okay, thank you very much. Who would like to open the discussion? Stuart, um, please. Can I ask a question about the Minister's right to decide whether in certain cases 
um, a, an alteration or an amendment is significant or not. Um, that decision can be reviewed by the courts. But in, in the action which I brought to try to force a referendum, which Martin Howe forecast correctly that I would lose, one of the reasons that I lost was that in the case of uh, the judge or the court said, we can't review the minister's decision about this. It's a political matter. We have to be guided on such matters by the politicians. And I'm just nervous that this, they may say the same sort of thing if a decision by the minister that uh, something isn't significant is made. And I wonder whether something should be inserted in an amendment to the effect that notwithstanding that some decision may be political, they must still decide whether it's reasonable or not. Right? I don't know, that may be more a legal, <laughs> a, a legal issue than the political one. Um, the, I, I think the, the thing is, quite apart from the question of whether the, the, the Act were worded in such a way uh, as to confer on, on judges uh, a right or a duty to conduct that sort of review, you would find the judiciary would be incredibly nervous of undertaking the task of, if you like, reviewing the merits of a political, it must be a political decision, is something significant or not. And in fact, not only in your case did this come up, there's a previous case um, called um, Orange Personal Communications on the validity of regulations under Section 2 of the European Communities Act, where the court said a very similar thing it was argued that Section 2.2 shouldn't be used for important provisions because various people, um, including, um, in fact, my uncle Geoffrey Howard, then Solicitor General, had told Parliament it would only be used for unimportant matters. Um, but the court said this really isn't a matter for us. We can't decide. Uh, we're not equipped to decide on whether or not something is important or sufficiently important. So I agree that um, the judicial review of this provision on significance will be very weak. I, I think um, the other aspects of the ministerial statement, judicial review will be stronger because the minister has to say with reasons whether or not a transfer of power um, will occur. And I think the courts will be much happier, if you like, in, you know, because that, those are the sort of decisions judges are used to coming to. You know, does it involve transfer of power or not? That's a fairly clear-cut clear -cut legal point. Um, on, on the other hand, the significance issue is only, uh, it's, uh, it's attracted a lot of attention, but in the bill, it's actually <coughs> only quite limited in its scope. It, with certain particular types of decisions, um, uh, or treaty changes, um, under one, sorry, under four, one, I and J of the bill. It doesn't cover across the board because most of the types of, uh, of changes that could be made will attract a referendum regardless of their significance or not. But it's just in these sort of marginal areas. Thank you very much. Um, now, can, any points that you'd like to raise? Yes, please. And um, will you introduce yes, yourself? Yes, uh, my name is I'm the Minister for Financial Affairs at the Embassy of Japan. Right. I have a question for each of the uh, speakers, uh, namely, uh, the first one is for uh, Mr. Reese uh, Mug. Um, this is indirectly related to the um, issue today, but I have a question about uh, the uh, legislation that was introduced uh, by the Treasury for assistance to Ireland. Uh, how, now, I've been informed by my Treasury <coughs> that they expect uh, a safe passage of the bill uh, this week, uh, if, if it may be choppy rather than smooth. Uh, now, what kind of uh, discussion would be expected if the legislation were come to your committee? Would it be much bumpier, choppier? <laughs> would it be in safe haven? Um, that's the first question. And maybe a corollary to this question is, um, what kind of argument could the Treasury or government put forward if a similar package, I mean, I'm not, I'm hoping that, that it will not be necessary, but if a similar package were required for, to bail out, say, Portugal. Okay, um, that's the, those <coughs> three uh, The question for um, <coughs> Mr. Howell is, uh, you mentioned that uh, you would argue to opt out of the 
uh, third pillar, uh, just as in police cooperation. Uh, what, what, how would that affect the current uh, uh, sort of um, arrest of uh, what is it, uh, the founder of WikiLeaks uh, with possible extradition to Sweden? And there, there was a, there's a suicide bomb uh, last Saturday in Stockholm with uh, possible connections to the suspect residing here uh, in London. Uh, what kind of sort of um, uh, effect would that have on these sort of extradition treaty? Thank you very much. I'm just going to go around the house to take a few more so that our speakers can just take a few time. Who else would like to open, make, make a point or ask a question? Yes, please. Robert Logan, German, German Embassy. Uh, I just wanted to make a point, not, not a question to, to Martin, uh, how um, you said that the German <coughs> Constitution was limiting the powers of the EU courts. It's not the case. In fact, uh, in our Constitution, we have a, a a, uh, a special clause that is integration friendly. So the question which the court, our, our constitutional court had to, to tackle with was the question, which powers can be handed over to the EU or what can be the um, participation by parliament and in which respect have the, have the, the parliament and the executive to work together. It's a bit, a bit different from your... Thank uh, you very much. <coughs> Anybody here? No? Right here? And Jacob, the uh, Japanese student. Yes, Mr. Kawakami. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your question. Um, the, Ireland, the, the, the bill is relatively easy because I think people are quite happy for the UK to make a sterling loan to Ireland as a matter of British policy and not to do it through the auspices of the European Union. I think there is still sufficient feeling that Ireland is a very friendly country, a neighbour, a lot of Irish people living in England, a country we have enormously close ties with and historic responsibilities to, that making a loan to Ireland um, under British law is all right. I think there are much greater concerns uh, about making loans to Ireland under the auspices of the European Emergency Package, which, as I understand it, has been put together under uh, a law that allows for loans to be made in the event of natural disasters. And those of us who are a skeptic of mine think that's absolutely typical of the European Union. You agree to one thing, and it's used for something completely and utterly different that you never intended. It's cobbled together by um, uh, um, Alistair Darling on his last or penultimate day as Chancellor of the Exchequer before a new government was formed, it's the political elite getting together to do over the taxpayer. And I think that side of it is pretty disgraceful, and there's a lot of opposition to money gain uh, by the uh, <coughs> mechanism. Um, there's then the IMF loan, uh, which I believe the Japanese will also generously be involved with, <laughs> say thank you very much for helping <laughs> our, our neighbour. Um, but I, I, I suppose it's fair to say that when the IMF went into South Korea, we also helped there. So there is some reciprocity uh, in this. Uh, as regards Portugal, um, I suppose I ought to say that since 1386, Portugal has been our closest, most long-standing ally, the Treaty of Windsor. So we have some obligation to Portugal for historic reasons uh, and might be willing to make them a, a, a loan for British policy reasons, but we really don't want to be in the business of making loans to bail out the euro. In, in my view, which won't surprise you to know is not the view of the British government, uh, it would be better for those countries that are struggling under the euro to devalue and default and begin to get their economies to grow again, that the level of depression that they will have to endure to make the system work is going to be unbearable for them, it will take many, many years, and is condemning them to um, lower living standards, which I don't think they want. And I think it's great pity that the ideal of European Union is um, putting such a, a downward pressure on these countries, and I hope the British government will encourage them to break free from the shackles of the euro, uh, rather than to and bear the burden for ultimately no good reason because I think you ultimately delay their need to come out of it rather than um, uh, keeping them in permanently 
unless our German friends would like to bail them out um, <laughs> fully, and that's that's a matter for, for, for Germany to decide. Thank you very much, Jake. Yes, can I, can I respond? In fact, can I just add a little bit to what Jake said on, on that point before coming on to the, the, the second point from Arsenal, because they're actually connected. It might not be obvious to you why they're connected. Uh, the um, European um, Economic uh, Assistance Package that was put together uh, is an example of what unfortunately is a, a really a, a quite common practice within the European Union which consists of total abuse of the powers under the treaty. And uh, uh, to characterize um, uh, aid to a, a country that has an excessive deficit uh, as falling within the emergency assistance clause of the treaty is a legal abuse, in my opinion. Um, now, the problem is the European Union suffers from the lack of any means of objective legal control over the use and abuse of powers under the treaty. Uh, there is the European Court of Justice, which is the sole arbiter of this kind of thing, and uh, it, it is, is so biased in favor of, of European integration um, that it's almost impossible to believe. Um, and uh, on this particular matter, um, uh, this is not the only matter where the jurisprudence of the European Court uh, has, leaves much to be desired. Um, and another matter that you, you may be interested in is, of course, the Alternative Investment Management Directive, which uh, is introduced under a treaty power, dealing with the rights of establishment of companies and self-employed people in other member states. And under the guise of this provision, the European Union takes it upon itself um, to pass legislation which is fundamentally an attack on the status of the City of London and its ability to conduct its business without interference um, from uh, uh, governments motivated by a desire to protect competing financial centres. The problem with the European Union is there is no fair umpire in the system, uh, and, and that is a very difficult problem, uh, which I can't see a solution to while this country remains a member of the European Union on its current terms. Uh, now, that, that brings me on to this, your, your question about um, third pillar measures and WikiLeaks and so on. Uh, of course, it is important to have uh, extradition arrangements between us and, and other European countries, <coughs> and also to have arrangements for the uh, cooperation in police investigations and the transfer uh, of, of information. Uh, and nobody in their right mind would argue that we should not have such arrangements. Uh, the question is what type of those arrangements they are and whether they are under our control or under the control of, of other people and are imposed upon us. And the problem with the third pillar measures within the structure of the European Union is they are quite unlike um, an international extraditional cooperation agreement all of which, and I'm sure probably all the agreements of this kind to which Japan is a party, will normally contain a review clause so that you can give notice of termination after 12 months, say. And the, the value of having that sort of clause is it means if you are not happy with the way in which it's operating, it doesn't mean you throw the whole treaty out, but it means you can go to the other parties and say, look, we're not happy, this needs to be reviewed, and we have the right to require it to be reviewed, otherwise ultimately we could pull out, that's not our right. Uh, and the third pillar measures lack those pretty <coughs> safeguards, and the effect of, of the, if you like, the non-opt-out I referred to, is that the interpretation of these measures will then come under the powers of the European Court of Justice, which for reasons I've indicated, is simply not to be trusted as an impartial court um, to guard the outer boundaries of, of the European Union. Now, sorry, so, um, your, your point about the, the German uh, uh, Federal Constitutional Court.